Thank you for attending today's virtual seminar titled Advances in Lysimeter Technology, Lighting Up the Black Box, presented by Leo Rivera. Advances in Lysimeter Technology, Lighting Up the Black Box. First off, what is the motivation behind lysimetry? Why do we even care? Why do we want to make these measurements? Why do we want to put all this effort into these really complex measurements? Well, first off, lysimetry tells us a lot about the water balance. It really truly is one of the best ways to measure and estimate the water balance. And what makes up the water balance? It's uh, understanding inputs from precipitation and irrigation, being able to measure evapotranspiration or estimate evapotranspiration, uh, deep drainage, and then the change uh, in storage of water in the soil. That's what makes up the water balance. Now, being able to accurately measure all of those components together is not an easy task. Another motivation behind lysimetry is, is understanding the solute balance. So where are things like nitrates uh, going in the soil or pesticides or other, uh, move, uh, other uh, water soluble compounds? Um, lysimetry is a really powerful tool to help understand that as well. Uh, and so um, it's really just the motivation behind that is to get a well-known water balance and, and behind that allows us to uh, have a good tool to also help estimate a solute transport investigation. Uh, so many of you have probably heard this before, but I always like to start out with the history of lysimeters. I think this is some really neat stories and, and, and uh, it, it's cool to see where lysimeters have been used in the past and how they've changed to now. Um, one of the earliest known users of lysimeters is a scientist by the name of Felipe de la Hire. Um, he was a, uh, a scientist, or he was a mathematician and meteorologist for King Louis XIV. Um, and he's commonly referred to as the instigator of the use of lysimeters. And his motivation behind uh, using lysimeters is they wanted to understand where uh, springs came from. And there was a variety of different um, theories behind this. And uh, what was, what's funny is some of those theories were, uh, uh, there were large crevasses in the ground that were uh, recharged by uh, either ocean water or, or condensation of moisture in the atmosphere. Um, and so Felipe de la Hire wanted to better understand where these springs were actually coming from. And so in order to do this, he built three cylindrical lysimeters um, with, uh, with different lengths to determine um, the weight that water moving through the soil or that, uh, that uh, drainage uh, had on the amount of water flowing in the springs. And uh, what he found, uh, well, one of the really interesting facts that he found at the time was that uh, soil without any vegetation on top of it had more water pass through it than soil with vegetation on top of it. And of course that was because of the impact that the vegetation had on the transpiration of water through, from the soil. And so uh, just kind of an interesting fact that they found at the time that uh, just kind of seems like common knowledge to us now, but at the time it wasn't. Another interesting uh, fact about lysimeters, um, in 1875, a botanist uh, and agronomist uh, from Massachusetts, Massa Massachusetts uh, by the name of Edward Lewis Sturdivant built the first lysimeter in the United States. And then uh, the first weighing lysimeter built in the U.S. was built in 1937 in Coshocton, Ohio. And there's an image of that lysimeter here, and, uh, and this is, really not very different from what we do now, besides the fact that we've improved the technology that we use to make these measurements. It's the same principles that we use now in weighing lysimeters. And uh, this uh, weighing lysimeter was able to show us the influence that dew formation had on different crops and, and, uh, and also the, what it had on the water balance and what the crops had on the water balance. And this is one of these those first types of early tools that helped us develop crop coefficients that we use in a lot of our uh, ET equations nowadays. 
So now let's go ahead and go into some different lysimeter techniques. And then we'll talk about the advances in, 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 in the technology and where we're at now and, and where we need to go. So one of the most basic measurements or basic tools available for measuring uh, deep drainage, so the most basic lysimeter is a zero tension or a pan lysimeter. Um, it's the most basic measurement of drainage and the way you can think of it is a simple collection pan buried in the soil. Um, you can either come in at the side and, and, and go below uh, the native soil and, and, and push it up in contact with the soil uh, or many people will just uh, um, excavate, install these and then repack the soil above the lysimeter. Now there are pro problems with zero tension lysimeters. Uh, one of those issues is water flows from low tension to high tension or from high potential to low potential. So the lower boundary of a pan lysimeter is at zero tension uh, and typically unless the soil is saturated uh, the, the water is going to be held in the soil at a higher tension than zero. Um, and so water in unsaturated, uh, in saturated soil will just typically tend to want to flow around the lysimeter or diverge, and so we call this a divergence issue, away from the lysimeter. And uh, so a representative sample of uh, drainage is, is only collected under saturated conditions. And so here's just kind of a simple example of that. Here we have a pan lysimeter at zero, that's at zero kPa, and say we have, oh, say we have the soil at 30 kPa because, or water being held in the soil at 30 kPa. Because of the, the issue with water wanting to flow only from low tension to high tension, it's just going to go around the lysimeter. So, uh, like I said, there's issues with pan lysimeters uh, or zero tension lysimeters. Um, you can mitigate the flow divergence problem somewhat. Um, some uh, approaches people will take to mitigate this problem are a larger measurement footprint and I know when I say larger I'm talking about several meters squared area and there's a good picture of that here in the bottom left hand corner of the of the slide uh, and this is a, a large pan lysimeter that's being used for measuring the water balance of a uh, of an alternative cover for landfills. Um, Another way that this can be mitigated is by installing vertical walls uh, around the lysimeter that go all the way to the surface, preferably all the way to the surface, to essentially trap the water uh, into the lysimeter area. So the only way it can go is down and it can't go around the lysimeter. But again, because we have this zero tension lower boundary, you actually change the way the soil is actually holding on to the water. So you actually change the water holding capacity of the soil. And so even with all of these uh, mitigation techniques, uh, collection efficiencies are still less than 10 percent. Um, so uh, not really the best tool for, uh, for measuring uh, deep drainage and trying to better understand the water balance. So the next step up from that and the next I'd say advancement in the technology would be the static tension lysimeter. And with the static tension lysimeter um, you can either have a vacuum pump or a wick used to create a static tension. And, uh, and this has helped really uh, a lot with the divergence issue. Um, but uh, because it's a static tension, there's also the possibility of flow convergence now. So essentially, uh, if the water is closer to, say, saturated conditions, and we have a, a static tension that's uh, maybe around 15 kPa, and the water in the soil is actually being held at uh, 5 kPa, then we actually will get flow convergence into the lysimeter and so we're actually overestimating uh, deep drainage. But here's an example of a, uh, of a wick lys type lysimeter and so they'll choose the length of wick to kind of uh, set that tension um, and then the water will drain into some type of measuring device whether it be a tipping bucket or um, if you're collecting and storing the water and measuring the actual uh, volume of water, uh, that's another way that the measurement can be made. And then of course it's measured with a data logger at the surface. So here's some examples talking about uh, the tensions we apply and kind of how they can affect uh, the water flow in the soil. 
So here's an optimal condition. Say the water is being held in the soil at the area of the lysimeter around 40 kPa and the tension we apply to the lysimeter is 45 kPa. Again, we have to, over, we have to apply a slightly higher tension to actually pull the water out from the soil or to, to make it move down. Um, in this condition, we would probably have close to 100% collection efficiencies, and this would be the, per, the ideal situation. Now, again, if we go back to the same example with the lysimeter uh, having the static tension of 45 kPa, and the water in the soil, or the condition, water conditions in the soil are that where the water is being held at the area of the lysimeter around 10 kPa, then we are now getting flow convergence into the lysimeter and we're overestimating deep drainage. So that's something that you have to consider when selecting the tensions that you apply to the lysimeter. Um, so uh, one of those uh, tools that we commonly use now, uh, we call them a passive capillary lysimeter. And with a passive capillary lysimeter, so we have the wick that we've optimized, that we've uh, chosen a length to apply a hanging water column to pull the tension on the soil water. And the static, uh, the static tension that we chose is, uh, is chosen to optimize the water collection efficiency. Um, and then we also add what we call the divergence control tube uh, to the top of the lysimeter to minimize the divergence and convergence from the soil. And so essentially what the divergence control tube is, is just a, 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 a cylinder, either steel, stainless steel, or, or, or plastic, PVC, something along those lines, uh, has the soil encapsulated in it. And what, we've, or what, what it's actually doing is it's extending the tension that the wick is applying up to the top of the uh, lysimeter. So an example, if you had a 60 centimeter wick, and a 60 centimeter divergence control tube, the total ten attention that you're applying is around 11 kPa. And so here's kind of just a breakdown of that with the wick in contact with the soil and the divergence control tube. And so here's some examples of the effects that the length of the divergence control tube has on the collection efficiencies of the lysimeter. And this is uh, these are data that was collected by uh, Glendon Gee and published in the paper that's cited below. Uh, so in this example, we have a sandy soil, and if we have just a 20 centimeter uh, divergence control tube, we get close to 100% collection efficiencies at all of these different examples of, uh, of uh, uh, deep drainage rates. So all the way from one millimeter per year up to uh, 10,000 millimeters per year. Now, oh, we'll go back. Uh, one other, th uh, so if we go up to a 60 centimeter uh, divergence control tube length, then we are getting 100% collection efficiencies across all of these uh, different uh, flow rates. Uh, now, if you were to do this, this same example with a clay type soil, uh, now we run into the setting, the, the issues where uh, we get good collection efficiencies in some of these uh, these flux rates. So mostly in the higher flux rates, the one th the one uh, thousand millimeters per year and the ten thousand millimeters per year. But uh, we don't get very good collection efficiencies at the low flux rate, so in the drier conditions, you could say. Now, this is an example of an unstructured clay. So if you are working in a structured clay that has good macropores and, and those types of things, then that's a different condition, and you actually would probably get higher collection efficiencies. But this is just uh, an example of an unstructured clay. And so that just kind of goes to uh, talk about some of the limitations with uh, passive capillary lysimeters. It's not going to work in all soil types. They're really optimally s made for sandy soils or well-structured soils. Um, so that's just something you have to remember. Um, some other improvements that we've made to passive capillary lysimeters uh, is one, getting eliminating moving parts. Um, uh, moving parts have the tendency to clog or, or, uh, or stop working especially when they're put underground and you can have soil particles moving through. So that's something that we really had to get rid of to improve the system. So one of the fir first tools that we had available to help improve this is uh, what we call the dosing siphon. And so that worked really well because essentially you just have a tube designed where uh, when the water level gets to a certain uh, level in the chamber, 
the pressure actually forces it to uh, to uh, drain out, and so uh, so that without any moving parts, and then we just use uh, a capacitance type sensor to measure the water level inside of the uh, chamber and determine when it's tipped. And so that was a, a great, really great change in the way the measurements were made and, and helped eliminate a lot of the issues. Now, there were still issues present with, uh, say, flooding due to saturated conditions if you had a seasonably high water table. Um, and also the, the sensor, we had, we had limited access to the sensor. And so when, if we did have flooding, it could cause the sensor to not work for a period of time. And in some cases, it could cause the sensor to fail. So we knew there was an issue with that. So well, let's, well, let's find another technique, another way to measure this uh, to help improve those issues. So the way we did this is we changed to a sealed system with a sensor access port on the side. And so here's an example of that. And, um, and uh, this helped eliminate the issue with the flooding due to seasonably high water tables. And because the sensor was accessible from the surface, uh, it was uh, easy to make, do maintenance on the sensor or replace the sensor if it ever does fail. And so it really helped with a lot of the issues we had in the past with the, even the, the dosing siphon. And what's really nice about the passive capillary lysimeters is with proper design uh, of, the, of the installation, um, you can resume normal tillage practices over the lysimeter. Um, which you can't do with all types of lysimeters, especially the, the weighing lysimeters that I will talk about shortly. So the next step up from the passive capillary lysimeter would be the controlled tension lysimeter. And so you can kind of think of it as a similar, the similar construction to the pan lysimeter, where we have, uh, in this case, say a ceramic plate installed in the soil um, at a certain depth. Um, but the one difference from, or the main important difference is that the tension in the lysimeter is actively controlled based on the soil water tension. So we have a tensiometer measuring the actual soil water tension and how it changes over time, and we use a vacuum system to actively control that, uh, the vacuum that's applied to the lysimeter, to match how conditions are changing in the soil. And so this really is the most accurate method for uh, determine, measuring deep drainage because we're constantly matching the field, the changes in the field dynamics. And, uh, and so that was a really, uh, becomes a really powerful tool for measuring deep drainage. Um, uh, now, one of the issues in the past with this is uh, there was really no system ready to go that made this easy to set up. Typically it required logger programming. And, uh, and so it, was, it took some expertise and time to get this set up. They weren't very inexpensive uh, and, uh, and oftentimes they were very power hungry. So, uh, so those were some of the limitations. Um, but again, like we said, this is probably one of the most accurate drainage measurement methods. Um, but it did have its drawbacks with it being expensive and, and fairly complex. Uh, now there are new turnkey systems uh, so that make this actually easier to implement and set up. There are vacuum systems set up ready to go where they will automatically read, read the tensiometer and actively change the vacuum level based on the user settings uh, to match the, the changes in the uh, water potential of the soil. And so and these new systems actually make it easier to implement a controlled tension lysimeter. Now, the next step up from that would be a weighing lysimeter. So with a weighing lysimeter, the, one of the advantages of a weighing lysimeter uh, is we can get a large surface area measurement. And so in this picture here, this is a station in, I believe, Spain, where they have multiple large weighing lysimeters set up uh, at this station to do different uh, studies of crops and, 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 uh, and how they can affect the water balance and do drought stress studies and a variety of different studies because of the, the things that weighing lysimeters allow us to do. Uh, it can be deep enough to encompass the root zone. Um, uh, you can make them as deep as a one and a half meters. I've seen some weighing lysimeters as deep as three meters. So uh, you kind of have some, some different flexibility there that you can uh, play with to 
uh, really encompass the root zone that you're trying to work with or the soil that you're trying to work with. Uh, with the weighing lysimeter, you use a precision load cell that con is continuously weighing the lysimeter. Um, so not only are you getting the deep drainage measurement, which is an important component and a hard to measure component of the water balance, but now because we're able to continuously weigh the soil weight or the lysimeter weight, we are now able to actually measure uh, storage in the, uh, of water in the soil. And so that's another important component of the water balance that we're able to measure with uh, weighing lysimeters. And with the weighing lysimeters, we'll do the same techniques that we use with the, uh, uh, with the control tension lysimeters. The lower boundary of the lysimeter is controlled with acti an active suction, a suction system uh, that is changing the suction uh, based on the changes in the native soil. So an important, uh, an important part about lysimeters, and especially with these weighing lysimeters, is we, you know, our goal is to match field water dynamics. So in this example, we have a weighing lysimeter with a tensiometer inside of the lysimeter itself and a tensiometer in the native soil next to it. And so our goal is to match how water is going to be moving through the soil to get an accurate understanding of, of what's actually happening or how the crops would actually interact with the actual soil and not just the soil inside of our lysimeter. And so, so if, say for an example, we have water coming in through the soil, uh, uh, say a precipitation event or an irrigation event. The uh, lysimeter is actively controlled to what's happening in the native soil, and so we get a good, accurate estimate of how the water is actually moving through the soil. Now, say for example, we're actually running into a different setting where uh, we have drier conditions out, we haven't had a whole lot of uh, precipitation, and there's actually, we're getting a uh, capillary rise of water, say from the groundwater, um, and the crops are actually able to pull that up in the native soil, so we're actually getting this rise of water. Now, in the lysimeter, the lower boundary is closed off from the, uh, from the groundwater and any potential uh, uh, upwards rise of uh, uh, water. So, uh, so we could run into issues with lysimeters where uh, the soil in the lysimeter is actually drier than the native soil because we weren't able to actually pull groundwater up. So in this case, we now use a bidirectional pump which would actually pump water back into the lysimeter to keep continuously uh, maintain the same uh, water potential at the lower boundary as the water potential in the native soil at that same depth. And so now we're actually able to accurately estimate uh, uh, the actual capillary rise of water and really just gives us a better uh, better estimate of the actual evapotranspiration of the crop in the native soil. And so this is a really power, powerful addition to uh, weighing lysimeters. So the next thing that, or the next issue that we ran into with lysimeters was the disconnect with the actual temperature dynamics of the soil. And so in an ideal setup, we want the temperature dynamics in the lysimeter to match what is actually happening in the field. This is especially important if you're doing uh, studies on changes in, in different nutrients or, or, or other compounds in the soil. And really just, I mean, the temperature dynamics of the soil affect a lot of things, so it's, it's, it's important to try and match what's actually happening in the soil. And in the past, we weren't able to do this. In the past, we had lysimeters installed in large rooms that were disconnected from the soil. Uh, and, and so there was no influence from the actual temperature dynamics in the native soil in this, in this small column. And another issue could be, say, for example, you have these lysimeters in a large room. That room has a doorway that's open to, uh, to the atmosphere. And if somebody opens that door, especially in a hot climate, say in, in the desert climate, where normally the soil at that depth is still fairly cool, uh, but if you open the door and you get a huge uh, movement of the heat from the outside into that room, you actually begin heating the soil. And so you're really definitely at that, at that point in time not accurately matching the, the uh, temperature dynamics in the native soil. So to change that, uh, what people have done, like UMS out of Germany, 
they've moved to uh, porous concrete well rings. So the soil is completely, uh, besides, uh, it's completely isolated from the access well except for a small tube that, that runs the cables and tubes to the loggers and, and control systems. Um, and because we have uh, porous concrete wells, um, they actually allow for what, what's called evaporation enthalpy uh, between the native soil and the lysimeter to help create a thermal equilibrium. And so uh, this has really helped um, better match the field uh, uh, temperature dynamics. And here's some example data of uh, measurements from inside of one of these lysimeters and the native soil. So if we were to look at the 35 centimeter measurement, you can see that the uh, measurement changes from the, wang, from the lysimeter uh, and the uh, native soil are almost spot on. So very, very close uh, matching of the temperature dynamics. And as we go down to the 60 centimeter depth, we're still very close to the actual temperature dynamics inside of the, um, in, or in the native soil inside of the lysimeter. Go down to the 90 centimeter depth now we're starting to get a little bit of divergence away from the uh, uh, native soil and the lysimeter, but we're still pretty close. Um, and so that's, that's, that's uh, a lot better than the way it used to be in the past. And then at the 180 centimeter uh, depth, still fairly close. At some points, some points in times, we're off by about two degrees C. Um, not exactly sure why they were off at those times and not off at other times, um, but still fairly closely matching the temperature dynamics inside of the uh, native soil. So the good and the bad with weighing lysimeters. Weighing lysimeters are the best possible quantification of the hydrologic cycle. We're able to accurately measure pretty much everything that's happening with the water in the soil, except for maybe the disconnect between lateral flow, but that's uh, Another, another issue for another day. Um, and uh, this is really helpful if you're doing climate change studies, eco-hydrology studies, a contaminant transport study, or even if you're just trying to do uh, estimate crop coefficients. Um, really, this is the best tool available for doing that. The drawbacks, uh, they're very, uh, the installation of these large weighing lysimeters takes large equipment, takes time, uh, it's not the safest thing. Uh, so there's a lot that goes into installing these. And they're also maintenance intensive and they're very expensive as well. So, um, so er, in order to get these types of measurements, it's typically taken a lot of time and money. But now we have things available like small scale weighable lysimeters. And with these small scale weighable lysimeters, we've been able to take the same technology that's used in the larger lysimeters, scale it down, and what this has done is allowed for easier installation and lower cost tools that we can use to get these same quality, quality of measurements from the large weighing lysimeters uh, in these smaller packages. Now they have their limitations as well because of the smaller footprint, um, but uh, they do help, so help us get closer to being able to more feasibly uh, with especially the limits of the way budgets are limited now. Uh, to a more feasible approach for accurately measuring uh, the water balance. So one of these tools available is the, is the Smart Field Lysimeter. This was a tool developed by UMS. And with the Smart Field Lysimeter, they have uh, different soil column heights available for different applications, depending on your root zone, how deep your soil actually is. And I'll talk, in, I'll, I'll talk about an example uh, where we're working with very shallow soils, and so the shallow lysimeter was actually a very useful uh, tool. Um, also with these uh, smart field lysimeters, you have a solar powered base station that essentially allows you to do remote installations. And now again, you're still gonna have to come out and check on uh, the drainage tanks and a few other things, but these uh, solar powered base stations make it where we can power the entire system without needing to bring in uh, power from, an, uh, from the main line or, or, or anything like that. Uh, we have the same precise lower boundary control uh, with the 
with the smart field isometers as we do with the large scale isometers. And here's an example of the tool that we use with the smart field isometers. Um, and so what you'll have is uh, this uh, plate at the bottom of the lysimeter, and this would actually be filled with silica flour, and they've, it's the uh, silica flour that's been chosen to optimize the air entry point to g get a good range of, of actual suction capabilities. And in this basin, we have these three suction cups that are applying the suction and pulling the, uh, uh, controlling the lower boundary. And then what's nice is they've actually implemented what's called a virtual tensiometer with one of these suction cups where there's an additional tube running out to a uh, pressure transducer. And so in this same, in this same basin, we're, all, we're actually able to measure the tension and control the tension at the lower boundary. And so this is a really nice tool, kind of eliminates the need to install another sensor inside of, this, inside of the lysimeter. And uh, with these smart field lysimeters, you have fairly easy ex excavation of intact monol monolith of an intact monolith with uh, hand tools, and so uh, this eliminates the need in most cases, unless you're working with the larger, the taller lysimeters, uh, it eliminates the need for um, for equipment, like you know, tractors or large equipment to actually be able to do the work. This can mostly all be done by hand. Um, and because of the smaller package, uh, you have the easier handling compared to the large lysimeters, um, except in the case of the, uh, the tall lysimeters. So an example like this, this 90 centimeter tall lysimeter. Um, you can do the extraction of the monolith by hand, but you're going to want to use some type of equipment to actually raise the monolith out of, this, out of the hole because it is just too heavy for a person or even two people to, to pick up out of the soil. Um, so it's, it's a much safer approach to use tools and equipment to actually pull this out of the soil. Uh, the installation can easily be done by hand. Um, here's an example of a station that's being installed here in the Palouse where they're installing three lysimeters. Almost all of the work was done by hand except for pulling the, the lysimeters and lowering the lysimeters into their access wells. And what's really nice is, you know, after our excavation, we try to minimize the disconnect between the native soil and the lysimeter. And so when everything is complete, the main disconnect between the surface of the lysimeter and the surface of the native soil is just a small rim that's used to uh, keep water and soil part, uh, particles out of the access well and also to allow the soil column to sit free so you can get an accurate weight measurement. So now let's go into some really cool applications of lysimeters. And one of my favorite applications is uh, this Torino soil can project that's being done in, G in Germany. And with, the, uh, with this project, they're take, they took 126 lysimeters, and these are the large-scale weighing lysimeters. Um, and they extracted these lysimeters at 12 different sites. And then what they did is they actually moved some of those soil columns to different parts of Germany, uh, or to different parts of the, of the region, to try and simulate what the effect that climate change is actually going to have on the soil. And uh, the main objective of this project was to characterize and quantify the effect of climate change on the carbon-nitrogen cycle and the uh, carbon and nitrogen storage, um, the biosphere-atmosphere exchange of greenhouse gases, and one of the cool tools that they used for this was a large robotic uh, chamber that moved across some lys across lysimeters to measure uh, uh, greenhouse gas exchanges. Uh, they also were looking at vegetation and microbial biodiversity and the temporal changes, tem temporal dynamics of carbon and nitrogen. Um, and also, uh, we, need to, we want to understand the effect on the hydrology, so water budget, um, how much, uh, uh, how will seepage water change, and also how will the water retention capacity of the soil change at these different, at these different climates. And here's uh, an example of the layout that they used at most of their sites, except for the site where they had the robotic, uh, um, the robotic uh, chamber that moved across the lysimeters. They used a six, six hexagon layout, um, and depending on how many lysimeters they had at the different sites, they would have, you know, up to three or four of these stations with six, uh, with six lysimeters around it. And um, everything ran to one main 
access well where they had the loggers and the vacuum the pumps controlling the lower boundary and everything and so this is a it's a really cool example of what you can do with lysimeters and and uh, and how this technology can be applied another uh, f uh example is uh, an example of using the actual in this case the small scale weigh weighable lysimeters to uh, better understand the effect of climate change in the alps and this is primarily the this is specifically the alps of northern italy and austria and uh, and these, uh, this area is an important uh, resource to the local economies. So it really is vital that they understand the effects that climate change may have on these areas. And, uh, and so in this case, they use the smart field lysimeters to, uh, to quantify uh, potential changes on deep drainage and, uh, and even vegetation impacts. Um, and, uh, and so it was really important that we had minimal disturbance at the site and uh, and also because we're working in the Alps, access to these sites was pretty difficult. And so, uh, in this case, the large type lysimeters didn't really fit in well, especially because the soil wasn't very deep either. The soil typically ranged from around 40 to 50 centimeters deep. So a uh, big lysimeter would really not fit in well here. And so that's where the, the, the shallow uh, smart field lysimeters came in and where they actually served as a good tool for this area. And so they were uh, able to install uh, multiple of these small lysimeters at different sites in uh, northern Italy and Austria without any large equipment. And most of the stuff could be hiked in um, because of the limited access. So that was a nice uh, uh, advantage of using the small uh, scale lysimeters here. And then one last example I want to talk about, and this is the most one more recent example for me, and one that I'm more heavily involved in, is a, a station that's being used to better understand the water balance in the Palouse, and uh, and also uh, the uh, better understand the issues with nitrate leaching in the Palouse. And so, this is a joint project with the University of Idaho researchers, um, uh, the the PI on this project is uh, Aaron Brooks. And uh, in this case, we're using three of the smart field lysimeters to look at nitrate leaching and, uh, and quantify the water balance of the different crops that are grown here in the Palouse, so primarily spring and winter wheat and uh, garbanzo beans. And so this is a really it's a fun project that, we're, that we're, they're working on here to really kind of go on to a bigger project that is dealing with big issues that we have here, and that's nitrate leaching. And that's a common issue that is found all over uh, the U.S. And, and lysimeters really provide a powerful tool to understand nitrate leaching and measure and estimate nitrate leaching. So I'll open that up to questions.